Today, it's my pleasure to talk with Marcus Owens, Executive Director of the African American Leadership Forum. Uh, the forum is over 1,500 African American leaders in our community working to build a just society that works well for everyone. Hello, Marcus. Hey, how you doing, Peter? Thanks for having me. I'm doing good. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes from the important work that you're doing to have a conversation with me and the Greater Mississippi Region. Um, let's start by talking more about the African American Leadership Forum. When did it start? What's the focus of the work? Yeah, so we started as a, a more of a grassroots uh, and top level organization that wanted to get leaders in the community together to address some of the disparities that were happening around education, economics, health and wellness, and family and culture. Um, and that movement started with about 50 people that came together from cross sector, you know, private sector, philanthropy, government, uh, as well as the nonprofit area and the, the spiritual sector of our, our community. And they just started, you know, taking bits and bits of work and just saying, okay, what is the problem we want to address? And what is the approach that we want to take to make sure that we build collectiveness within community and we convene and then we champion the things that are working. Um, and we've been around for about 13 years now um, and have gone through diff different iterations and more formalness has happened over the past few years since I've been here with the organization. Hmm. Well, um, the impact of COVID-19 has been widespread. Uh, but it's been especially hard on Black families and communities and businesses. Um, what are you seeing? Uh, what's what's the impact been in our community? Yeah, it's it's happening on several fronts right now. I mean, one of the biggest things, I, obviously, is the health concern. I mean, this is a virus. It's it's not uh, discriminative to anybody. However, when you have a community that has underlying um, health con conditions, such as diabetes, asthma, things like that, it hits harder, right? And across the country, we're seeing black communities such as Chicago and Detroit getting really ravished with the, the confirmed cases and deaths. And so those things really worry the community members here because they have family in those cities already, right? Mm -hmm. So they hear firsthand what's happening. Um, and as we're looking at the Minnesota Department of Health's information, we're also starting to pay attention to what's happening within the African Americans within the state of Minnesota. And those rates are starting to go up as well. So we're, we're nervous on the health front. Fortunately, our government has done a pretty decent job of addressing the issues right away so we don't see the big spike yet. Uh, so we can start to prepare ourselves um, for uh, an eventual spike, right? Um, but then there's other fronts that are hitting. Obviously with the state being closed economically, um, it's impacting jobs as well as our businesses. Um, particularly our businesses are getting hit hard because having service-based businesses, um, first off, you know, and being closed, there's no other form of uh, virtual uh, business that you can do right now. If you're a barber, if you're a beauty salon, you know, if you're even a janitor or, uh, you know, maybe someone that does house cleaning and things like that, you're not really able to take your business virtually. Um, and many times you're a business that's, you know, one to five employees, so you're not very big, so you don't have a lot of infrastructure already. And you're not really prepared to like take this on as a business um, for five weeks now at a time and maybe even longer, right? Uh, and then we're also seeing issues within education. I mean, I think this is a really, um, you know, tough time for families, you know, having to adjust being at home, may not have already had the right setup for their children, but then now knowing that they're not going to go back to school for the rest of the school year makes community members really nervous about what that looks like for the next even year for our students and how far they may fall back um, if they don't have the right support system. So it's, it's hitting on a lot of fronts right now, um, but there's been a lot of great energy in terms of getting the right information out to community, making sure that we're being prepared, getting the organizations and leaders convened so that they know how to approach and uh, create solutions for community right now. Well, you talked about um, businesses, um, and you know it's just this has been so. I mean, challenging is not the word. Yeah, uh, you know, for small, medium-sized businesses um, across the board, you've been doing a survey uh, yeah. to understand what's going on and to need to support Black businesses during this outbreak. Uh, what are you learning from the survey? Yeah, so this survey came out of a collective uh, of Black. Uh, business supporting organizations. So we have the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce, the Northside Economic Opportunity Network, MEDA, the Neighborhood Development Center, Black Women's Wealth Alliance, Social Impact Strategies Group, the West Broadway Area Coalition, 
as well as uh, CRF and uh, Gravity. So these organizations support black businesses across the spectrum in the Twin Cities and across Minnesota for that matter. And we convened them over the past five weeks to say, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? And so the survey came out of that group and they said, okay, we need to, we need to figure out what's going on, how this is gonna impact. So over the last four weeks now, we've had about 90 responses from businesses that are targeted under the $500,000 or, or less revenue perspective per year. Um, and we're learning a lot of things from them in terms of just how they feel overall about this, uh, this, uh, this virus and the impact to their business. I mean, 92% said that it's either a moderate or significant impact on their businesses. You know, they really feel like, you know, it's going to hit them in terms of reduction in staff, obviously, because of the closures, less revenue. Um, they have risk of eviction if they have a lease property um, and then risk of closure and this overall difficulty to pay bills. So, you know, we're hearing from them right now um, that those are the big impact that this is going to have. And then we also talk to them about, you know, what industry are you in? And we're seeing health and beauty um, being responses professional services, healthcare, both in-home and then um, out-of-home, construction and then food services, right? So you, you get a cross-sector uh, of businesses that are being impacted. And the things that they need overall and that, that they're thinking about is obviously capital and then support. And so when we think about, you know, this is not just about, hey, sign up for the PPP, you get a loan, great, you're good to go. You know, first of all, with PPP, we're seeing a lot of challenges with these businesses in terms of even being able to get an application in. Yeah. Um, when you think about infrastructure for businesses, I mean, if you're running payroll, do you have the right system to be able to extract that 2019 data right away, get it from your CPA, and then get it into the bank? Well, these businesses that we're talking to right now and that are supported through these organizations, one, a lot of times don't have a really good relationship with banks in the first place. So when we think about long-term solutions, like how do we have better access to financial institutions for these businesses, right? The other part then is when we create systems such as the PPP or the, the EIDL or even the emergency loan fund from DEED, are the processes that we're creating actually equitable to get to these businesses or are we making it such a way that only certain businesses get access right away because it's first come first serve, right? So that's capital, but then non-capital is just thinking about, you know, strategic problem solving. I mean, it sounds basic, but thinking about, well, okay, if I have to pay bills and I only have so much, um, you know, capital that I can use, what are the strategic ways to utilize this capital so that I can maintain my business, pay my employees, and even stay afloat so that when this actually, you know, I can open up again, I can still be in business, right? Um, the other part, obviously, is that this is going to change. I mean, even if the, the economy opens up in the next three weeks, we're not back to normal, right? And so there's going to be a lot of precautions that businesses are going to have to take and being able to think through like, okay, what type of supplies am I going to need? What type of setup and processes am I going to have to, to receive customers? You know, all these things are supported um, through organizations such as the, the collective that we brought together. So we're trying to figure out, obviously, how do we get businesses the capital they need right now? But then how can we start to be strategic about the support that's being provided that is targeted and that is actually going to create impact so that these businesses can get some level of normalcy when this is all done? So you're, you know, the forum has been, you know, reprioritizing in response to what you're learning and what you're seeing and you're hearing a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. What are a couple of the really specific things that you're focused on right now, you know, this week and next week or this month um, in response yeah. to some of the challenges you heard? Yeah, I mean, this week, probably in the next, I'd say five to seven days, it's like get as many businesses apply to PPP as possible. Um, the first wave did not, we, we did not have a lot of success of getting businesses applied on time. Yeah. You know, even as a nonprofit organization, we applied on the very first day that you could apply and didn't get a response until midnight of the day that the money ran out. So it's like, you got to get people applied, right? Yeah. Um, so that's first things first. I think then uh, um, thinking out two to three weeks is, okay, the economy is going to open up again. What does that look like? How do we start to you know, narrow in on the specific things that businesses can do? Thinking about cooperative buying, for instance, if it comes to barbershops and beauty salons needing supplies, PPE supplies mm -hmm. to be able to do services again. So being very targeted about 
what are the things that we can do to organize now so that in the event that economy opens up, businesses feel comfortable opening up and serving their clients, and then they're actually protecting their clients when they come in. So I'd say those are the two things. But then the, the, the third thing then is getting resources into these organizations that are going to be doing the work to support these businesses yeah. long term to make sure that they have the capacity to not just you know scratch the surface but go deep and stretch out and touch the businesses that they can right. touch yeah. well um thank goodness you're doing that work um and that you're here for the community in this moment what yeah. can other leaders and organizations in this region do to support the forum or support the broader mission of the forum right now and yeah. really welcome your specifics yeah, I mean, I mean, first things first, if if you have um, funds that you're creating um, in terms of response funds, uh, capital, things like that, you want to impact community, we have a response uh, capital fund that we are putting together. We're the intermediary and able to get resources down to the business level as well as the organization supporting. So that's first. Um, two, if you are someone that is um, adept with providing technical assistance for businesses, definitely reach out to us. Um, you can reach me at Marcus at AALFTC.org. You know, share that with us because we want to connect businesses with the support that they need, obviously. Third thing is, is like when we're thinking about policy in particular, as we want to get different things set up for whether it's unemployment or education or even testing for that matter, making sure that we're including voices from the community in those conversations, not a as an afterthought, you know, I think, you know, what's the challenge is, is we want to get work done fast. Yep. Um, a lot of times different segments of our community don't move as fast as we'd like them to, even though we want the government to move fast or we want the private sector to move fast, right? But including those voices in the conversation can allow for the ramping up of the, the, the quickness that we want to, to, to move. So include those voices in decision making, not just as an inform, informative um, body. Those would be the, yeah. the first three things. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's a great place to start. And those are some big things in that, um, you know, getting more voices into the decision making is a crisis piece. It's a recovery piece, and it should be something uh, going forward. Uh, the Graham Street Partnership is focused Absolutely. on making sure that this region and state come out of the crisis better than we went into it. It's not about getting back. It's about becoming better. And being better means we have to be more racially inclusive in this economy. So in right. your view, uh, let's talk about what that would look like. What, what are we aiming for? What should we be building toward um, as we come out of this crisis and we work on recovery so we are a more racially inclusive economy and society? You know, what needs to be different in this region and state coming out of the crisis? Oh man, I mean, you know- It's a, it's in, a simple in, question. It's, right? it's simple, but you, you got know, a couple it's- minutes? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. How long do you got? Um, you know, the 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 challenge in this is is the simplicity of inclusion, right? Inclusion is not something where because you and I talk, therefore we're in relationship. Mm -hmm. Being in relationship allows for those voices not only to be at the table but to be heard. You know, being able to then articulate um, across the table what what people really care about. Uh, so if it's around economic inclusion, it's not just enough to put someone at the table, but it's allowing them to have access and an invitation to provide insight that then is turned into solutions, right? Um, you know, I would, I would love to see us, you know, thinking about the, the processes and the systems go from just intention to direct action and um, impact in these communities, right? Um, from a, a health perspective, I would love to see that you know, as we move forward, that we're not just thinking about the right now. And I don't want folks to think that, well, African Americans are more susceptible to this disease because of genetics, right? No, it's conditions in which these communities have. We have poor air quality in, in places like North Minneapolis and east side of St. Paul because of factories and things like that, uh, which cause asthma and other uh, health related things. Uh, we have issues with um, the housing that we have. So if you have exposure to lead and you have exposure to other um, chemicals or poisons within your house, your health is going to be, you know, at a lower case. If you are in a situation in which you're not economically viable as a family or as a community, you have other factors such as stress and emotional distress that then lead to uh, 
other things that then cause health. So this is a holistic and long-term approach. So how can we you know, think about this time now that we're disrupted and everything is shook up, mm -hmm. how can we really be disruptive and not just have the debate anymore, mm -hmm. but actually say, let's do it, let's try it. You know, let's think about, you know, a universal health care or universal income or ways that we don't have to be so reliant on a, a 40 hour work week um, and a, a full time job and a minimum wage of nine dollars or fifteen dollars. Like, let's make sure that we're taking care of people so that we don't have to take care of them yeah. during times like this. Right. Right. That's the pain. Right. That we're feeling. But at the same time, you can see government and other sectors being very responsive. I mean, you look at the the um, the mask that uh, the N95 mask. Those things, you couldn't even disinfect them now. And now all of a sudden we have a solution just like that. Yeah. Things like that can happen if we're put under pressure. But let's not have to be under pressure to make the changes like that within our community and within our state. Because we have a great state. Let's make it work for everybody right now. Yeah, well, big questions, big solutions. I think that's a really powerful point too of we're seeing the most, uh, per, the problems that are perceived to be most urgent get solved. Right. Right. So and, and let's let's make sure that, you know, we're listening to communities that saying, hey, this is urgent for us. And it should be as urgent for you because you're our neighbor. You are a community member. You're part of, you know, the state, too. We're not a separate community. We're part of this greater community. And if we all do well, we can focus in on what's really important and not have to, like, tackle everything all at once. Well, speaking of tackling everything at once um, as a leader uh, in a time of crisis, of an organization, yeah. you know, a leader in a community. Um, just want to get a sense from you about, you know, what you're learning, you know, through this. And we're only four or five weeks into it. I mean, as we were talking before, it seems like it's hard to remember what early February felt like. Right. It wasn't that long ago. A lot's changed. Yeah. And how is it affecting, you know, the way you're thinking about, um, you know, how you lead and, and you know, yeah. the priorities for the community for the future? Yeah, I think the, the thing that is really rung true to me now is that we're far more adaptable as a people than we think we are. And some of those norms that we have like bought into, such as the way we work, have really been shook up. And it doesn't take very long to adapt to a world like this yeah. you know, Zoom call that we're having. As much as we love to be in person and having meetings, you know, we can be far more flexible with how we work because we can be far more productive when we can just get into flow. So, yeah. I mean, this whole virtual space, it's amazing. I mean, we were fighting to get, you know, uh, gatherings of a hundred or so people together on a regular basis because of different factors or barriers such as cost or location or what have you. And we hosted 1800 people yesterday on a virtual call no. to talk yeah. about the health impact. So it's like, oh, that's all we had to do? It's put it on a Zoom call and let everybody watch. So, I mean, technology, you know, we couldn't have had something like this happen at a better time because of the access of, of technology that's available. Now, the, the hope is that, you know, we're smart about it as businesses and organizations to create um, adaptability within our organizations and not being so fixed in terms of how our processes or how our th our, we think our culture is and we can't be adaptive. It's like, no, we can be. We just have to have the ability to, you know, be flexible and adaptive to what the environment is presenting to us at any given time. So that's probably the biggest mm -hmm. learning right now. And then I'm starting to think whether or not I'd even need an office anymore. Maybe I can work from home for the rest of my life. I don't know. <laughs> you must be having a great work from home experience. <laughs> oh, it's, it's been great. It's been great. So, you know, I've, I even have kids knocking at my door right now trying to give me lunch so you know <laughs> you can't beat that yeah the team just got bigger but that's the yeah you know the other part too is like you know what i'm appreciative and blessed at this time is like being able to be you know you know have a job right now one and then being able to be with my kids i mean you know usually i drop them off and i don't see them for 30 hours a week right yep. and now i'm here every day i can pop down off of this call and then go talk to them and build relationships so i think having that time to really reflect and um, appreciate family and friends and what we did have and what we do have yeah. um, is really important for everybody. So I tell my team to make sure you're, you know, not just working, but you're focusing on your family and yourself right now, because even though you don't see the virus, you don't see the impact on you if you're not sick, it's impacting all of us. So maintaining emotional and mental health is important 
for all of our organizations because it ultimately at the end of the day it's about people in our teams and if our people in our teams aren't healthy you know the work is not healthy so yeah yeah i mean as as, as difficult and uncertain as this all is there are some hidden gifts you know if we look for them absolutely absolutely well, thanks for everything you're doing and for it's not just you it's a network of you know well over a thousand mm -hmm. other people in this community um so thank you we want to uh, wrap around and support that work and you know we'll be talking um and we'll get through this and we'll be we'll do it better well thank you peter thank you guys for all that you're doing to make sure that you know information and awareness is being built around these various communities within our community here in the state of minnesota absolutely all right thank you marcus all right take care everybody